Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm still, uh, I'm pretty new to this platform. Um, maybe if I can just get a little uh, confirmation in chat that I'm coming through okay. I know I'm on a bit of a, a bit of a delay here. Uh, we will get cooking. A uh, bit of a kooky morning. I think I, I, I meant to do this from my office, but uh, got a last minute call this morning that there are some people here. Okay, sweet, you can hear me. Uh, there's some people here working on my uh, on a door in my house, so there's a little bit of construction going on. So I've asked I've asked them to to hammer lightly, uh, and uh, so that might come through at some point. And uh, because I'm at my house and I have two two little boys, there's a a neighborhood of uh, children that could come ringing my doorbell at uh, at any moment. So uh, uh, I've put a sign up on the door. Um, uh, do not ring doorbell. So we'll we'll hope that that uh, we'll hope that they can uh, get that sign gets through to them. So uh, I am just going to kind of jump in here. So I'm just going to move. I can see people chatting. I'm glad you can hear me. Hope everybody's having a good um, a good learning academy this uh, this week. And I hope everybody's having a great uh, refreshing summer after uh, a very very strange uh, year in education. So. Uh, my my presentation should be up here. I believe you can see it. You should see a big screen with some blue uh, writing on it and 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 stuff that says no more uh, easy button. So I'm hoping that uh, that's coming through to you. Um, and uh, my session is uh, it's really it's it's really an optimistic uh, thinking. Uh, it's about uh, it's about thinking what it looks like coming out of this pandemic. And I know we're not you know fully out of it yet, and we. We have these things like the the Delta variant going on and, and all that stuff, but but it it feels like there's light at the end of the tunnel. It feels like there's changes coming. So I, I wanted to make something that was uh, sort of hopeful and 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 thinking about you know what do we do what do we do when all this all this kind of crap is over. So you know the basic premise of this session is you know teaching and learning have the potential to shift dramatically as we come out of this catastrophe and uh, I've you know I've been thinking about this a lot and I got this idea from a from a podcast a cult of pedagogy podcast it's 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 almost shamelessly ripped off called no more easy button and uh, it's really about us as educators having taking on this shared responsibility to, to change so so I'm, I am going to be talking about how um, how, how we have this potential for change as, as, as uh, we come out of the pandemic uh, before we get too deep into it, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll introduce myself. My my name is uh, Adam Hinton, and uh, I, I work in CCRCE. Uh, presently, I'm a I'm a regional SSP consultant, so I, I work with uh, administrators and and teachers on uh, their SSP programming and collection of data, and you know the stories that they're trying to to build into their school. Um, prior to that, for a number of years, I worked as a, a, a technology integration specialist. Um, supporting teachers in in, uh, in in integrating technology into their their practices and their pedagogy, and and before that, I taught at a, a variety of, of grade levels, uh, mostly at a middle school called Redcliffe uh, in in uh, Valley, um, teaching literacy. So I come from a literacy an ELA background, um, but uh, I kind of have dabbled in, in in everything. I do have my email on there, um, and I have uh, my Twitter on there, which is kind of I realize it's kind of annoying to type in that Twitter because it's it's kind of annoying to type in underscores but that's that's me I have in the chat posted my um, this a link to this session I'm gonna just repost it again right now so a link should be there in the chat if you wish to if you wish to uh, follow along as uh, as we go so that's me uh, so before I get started I mean I, I always like to have a little preamble like where am I coming from and what do I kind of believe in? And I, I want to put kind of my my educational politics on the table here just so you know know who I am. So I, I kind of have these like non-negotiable. So everything I'm talking about today comes from this kind of four, four, these four pillars of, of thinking, right? So the number one thing that 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 I, I always try to keep in mind no matter what I'm doing is as a teacher, as a mentor, as a consultant, is that students are the center of everything that we do. So I'm only really interested in um, 
I'm only really interested in actions, uh, procedures, policies that directly affect students. I really, I really put them at, at the center. I value educators. I value parents. I value administrators. I value all of our workers. But at the 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 the, the center of everything, the first responsibility, the first priority is always it's always students for me. So I'm always thinking about what's best for students first. Uh, relationships are central to all learning. I think that. You know, we, we, we've come so far in the last number of years in really defining what relationships mean to us and just how important um, they are. And, and, and I, I don't think that teaching works if you don't know how to foster excellent relationships and understand and get to know uh, your students. I just don't think that you can have learning going on. Uh, another big thing for me, design should be centered around engagement and fun. I think school shouldn't feel like you know what we think school feels like i think that school should feel fun i think that school should be something when you ask somebody about it they say that they love it i think that whenever you're planning something you need to uh, sprinkle in the ingredient of engagement how can i engage the kids before you think about uh, the the learning uh, and then lastly archaic mundane ineffective structures uh, should be avoided or iterated upon. So if it feels outdated, if it feels like it's not effective, if it feels like it's stale, I think that, you know, you should just kind of get rid of it or you should iterate on it to make it more engaging. So those are just kinds of, these are four little things that I'm kind of always thinking about whenever I talk about anything. So that's, you'll, you'll see some of that woven uh, into our, into our discussion today. And uh, I will say, before we start getting into it, I'm going to talk about the session flow. If at any time you have a question or anything like that, uh, I, I, I hope that this would be really nice and interactive, but I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming that there's no microphone option for you. So feel free to chat, and I'll try to address your questions as, as best I can. Um, so at any point. Uh, so the flow, it's basically I've broken it down into four little sections. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about this morning the easy button. What is the easy button? Uh, what is it, and why do we uh, why do we why do we do it? Okay, uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, what I've kind of termed the wake of change: how disaster breeds progress in education. Uh, then the, the third section is just a kind of a, a new mantra: not more, just different. What are what are some domains that we can think about for for change post pandemic? And then the last section I've called atomic commitment. So, what are some practical ways that we can think about? you know, changing things up in light of all of the pressures and stresses of, 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 of teaching. So that's kind of how this is going to going to flow. Um, so I guess I'm just going to sort of jump right into it and talk about the easy button. And, you know, I say here, I hit the easy button, you hit the easy button, everybody hits the easy button at certain times. And I'm not saying to, you know, sometimes we just have to, it's if, if, if we're tired or exhausted, there's, we have to take sort of an easier, an easier path. But I want to think a little bit about the barriers um, right now to to, um, to to teaching. So, you know, I mean, teaching is 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 difficult, and being in a classroom is very difficult. And I've taught in classrooms with, you know, 34 people and very little space, and I'm teaching, you know, six seven different subjects, and I'm constantly marking things, and it's like. You are, you're, it, it, it's, you know, the, the job and the activities and all the little minutia of, of teaching, it, it builds up very, very quickly. And, you know, every September, you know, I always used to start in a very hopeful place and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to reinvigorate everything. And then every, then, 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 you know, the practicalities kind of start to bog you down and, and you start finding yourselves every now and then taking, you know, a couple shortcuts, right? It's like, uh, you know, um, if you're if you're you know if you're on if you're on a diet and I've been on diets before where and you're doing really good and uh, you know I'm like oh, I've been eating really really healthy and I feel good and my you know my waistline looks pretty good and you know I maybe I can kind of sneak in uh, you know a bag of chips uh, you know as a, as a reward and then you know sometimes it's that's just that easy button and then you start kind of slipping and you get into those habits where you're you know you're going for the easy choices as, as opposed to to the hard choices right so um and in education the same thing happens where you know sometimes it's like oh maybe i'll just print off a whole bunch of these worksheets and it's going to eat up like 45 minutes and i can just kind of i can cruise a little bit so and there's nothing wrong with that happening every now and then but but this presentation is really about thinking about how can we, how can we move away from that and not be tempted so often uh, by by the easy button what's a practical path for that 
So, I mean, thinking about this, and there's, I've got four things here. This is what 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 makes teaching so hard, and uh, there's more than four things. I mean, teaching is is teaching is a taxing, mentally, physically taxing job, and I and I and I I completely understand that. So, some of the things that are that I think that are big barriers in 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 pre-pandemic teaching or in, in and in post-pandemic teaching. You know, we've got old structures, you know, we've got old rules and old regulations and, and old procedures. And I mean, despite all the all the progress that we've had in education in the last you know, 10, 15 years, I mean, it's still pretty much largely unchanged from from the 1900s in terms of, you know, we kind of move people through grade cohorts and, you know, there's structures in schools and high schools and all kinds of things like that, 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 that largely retain themselves. So, you know, it's really hard to break out of those, uh, those structures and do anything creative or innovative or, or, or fun. So those are, that's, that's a barrier. There's also old cultures in schools. There's some schools and, and, and you may work in a really nice, progressive, exciting school where teachers want to try out new things. And, and I've certainly been a part of a number of those schools. Um, there's also schools that, you know, there's one school that I worked at a few years ago and I, I went in and I wanted to be this kind of do some exciting stuff. And, and the teacher, one of the teachers pulled me aside, department head and said, no, 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 we don't do that. That's that's not the way we do it here. You know, you just kind of you put your head down, you go in, you kind of do your thing, and this is this is how it goes. And so I was kind of I was tamped down by by the culture of the school, and that's 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 fun. That can hold you back from from trying out um, trying out things. Um, we have large classes, we have stuffed rooms, we have lots of students to think about. You know, and we're constantly talking about inclusion and relationships and small group. And it's harder to do the larger that our, our, our classes are, right? You know, when I taught, uh, I taught my first year out of ed school, I taught in Korea. I taught a, a, a grade three class. I had four students, right? I had so much progress. I could do so much. I could work with them as individuals and small groups on really intensive things with four kids. My next year, when I, when I came back to Canada, my class was 31 students. And I realized that all the luxuries that I had had of, uh, uh, were gone, and I, I had to really think on my feet and strategize on how, how do you how do you have meaningful small group and relationships and things like that when you have so many kids in front of you, right? And then sometimes we have strange expectations, and I mean, you know, I see you know that we our our region might have some things that they want us to try out, our principal might have some things that they want us to try out, the province has things that we want to try out, and sometimes you know I I think. The, the message I got from a lot of teachers this year was that, you know, we're in a bit of initiative overload, right? You know, we, 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 we thrive on when things are simple and clear and digestible and, and it doesn't work if lots of things are flying at us. So we need to be able to sift through that and prioritize and say, no, I'm, I'm laser focusing on these two or three things. And that's, that's, that's what I want my, my system to be this year, not 50 other things. It's hard to do, but sometimes I'm gonna talk about, you know, maybe you have to be a little bit courageous sometimes as a teacher and be able to say to say no. So a couple things, maybe if we're thinking about what are what are the easy buttons in education? What are the, what are the things that we sort of go for? What's the what's the junk food that sometimes we 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 snack on um, when we when we could be doing something a little bit healthier? So the first one is you know, summative versus uh, formative, right? So it's very, very easy to, to do summative stuff. It's very easy to, to make a multiple choice quiz. It's very easy to to get a, uh, you know, these concrete answers and whip them out. Um, formative is different. It's more time intensive. It, it requires us to uh, converse more with students. It requires us to have good observational skills. It requires us to be able to track, um, you know, types of data that are, 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 are much more uh, anecdotal and, and, and conversational. Um, so, you know, it's very, very easy and tempting to always go for that summative piece. But the trade-off is sometimes when you're doing too many summative things, you're overwhelmed with marking. Whereas informative, a lot of your assessment is done in real time. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we've got digital tools now that, that can do all of the formative assessment uh, data management for you. A uh, whole class versus small group. It's very easy to talk to your class. It's very easy to lecture to your class. It's very easy to talk to them. Uh, it's much harder to set up small group um, small group uh, settings, right? 
it's hard if you want to work with you know three or four kids and then you've got the rest of your class doing something how do you structure that how do you get that set up how do you how do you, how do you build that um and that's a big that's a big priority if you want to have small group you need to have good management on what your students are doing that are not in the group with you right and it has to be frequent and intensive another easy button things that are standardized versus multivaried i mean it's very easy for me to say i want everybody to make a powerpoint i want everybody to make um you know a, a poster i want everybody to do this worksheet but you know we know if we're thinking about inclusive education and we're thinking about universal design for learning we have to have a toolkit for our students that they they have choice they have multiple ways of showing that they're successful we have to be more open sometimes in saying okay maybe you do do the powerpoint and maybe you do the poster if you're interested in that. Maybe you make the video. Maybe you record a podcast, right? So we have to give our students tools and and kind of open ourselves up a little bit to to you know letting them try different things, different projects, and giving them agency over that. You know, we have a big thing about completionism and engagement. Sometimes it's about okay, we got to finish this. I got to get this checklist off. I got to wrap this up, right? And that's not very engaging for students. Whereas, you know, we want stuff that when when our students go home, they like like the best thing as a teacher is that your kids go home and they are excited to tell their their parents about what they what they did today, or they're excited to come into class, or they the best feeling and you've probably had this before is when they say, "Oh, can we do that again? Can we do this again?" Like, it's 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 uh, it's big. And yeah, uh, Mario. Yeah, re regarding form assessments, to be great to have more feedback over grades. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into that a bit in a little bit, Mario, as well. Um, and then procedural versus high level. Sometimes it's just we we're just kind of doing the things because we've got them, we've done them for years. Okay, you know, I do this quiz, I do this unit, I do this activity. Whereas we need to constantly be thinking about what are what are our high leverage practices? What are the practices that we know yield? Uh, excellent learning from our students. So those. So it's it's. I just wanted to think about this. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but just to think about those are some of those easy buttons, and 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 you just look at those: the summative, the whole class, standardized, completionism, procedural, and just kind of consider that you know these are these are things that that I'm not saying that you need to flush them down the toilet, but we always want to move away from them as as best as we can. That's kind of my my thesis here. So. I guess you know why why am I talking about this now? Why am I thinking about this in post post pandemic, right? So the, the pandemic's been a catastrophe for, for for teachers and for families and for students, right? But I guess what I what, what I what I want to come at this from is is where we're coming out of this pandemic, and I really believe that we are coming out of this pandemic. You know, when, whenever there is a massive um, shock to a, a, a system in an educational system, there's often great opportunities for change, okay? And the opportunity to not necessarily go back to normal, right? And my my thing here is like why would why do you why do we need to go back to normal if normal doesn't work for a lot of our kids? Right? What 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 can we change? We should, we need to think about the fact that this is this is almost a bit of a reset. Okay? And I'm going to show you a couple examples of how how countries or societies have gone on on a reset. So the first one I'll talk about in, in England, there's this, there's in 1944, there was the Butler Act, which was introduced. It was a post-war reform act for education. And it, it changed up how schooling worked in, in, in the UK. And it increased compulsory hours for, for, for public education. So it, it set, you know, a standard school day. Okay. So that was, that was a big, big thing. And it abolished a lot of the fees. So it kind of opened up our, our, our free public school system in, in, in the UK. And they had great results. It standardized schooling uh, in 1944. And this was done after World War II as an initiative to say, okay, we need to rethink what education is. And we have a really good, this is great. This is a new world. This is a new time to think about it after, after World War II. Let's, let's, let's try this out. Okay. There was other stuff in the Butler Act that was kind of not good. Like I don't, I don't think it promoted evolution and things like that. But, but aside from that, it was, it, it was, it was good. Um, after uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, massive, massive disaster. Schools destroyed everywhere. After the the, the tragedy, um, the 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 state government put in sweeping reforms in math and literacy. Right. They said, okay, 
you know what, chaos everywhere, everything's destroyed, we've got a new opportunity, we're building new sites, we're building new schools, let's, let's build a new system, not just new schools. So they did sweeping reforms in math and literacy, and as a result, their graduation rates have increased by 13%. So again, all this is to say is that, you know, you're seeing these disasters, and then people taking opportunity out of the disaster. Okay, something a little more similar to, to uh, the pandemic. You know, there was the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, right? So schools were closed for nine months. And when they came back in, this the educational system said, okay, it's, you know what? Let's target support for our poorest children, okay? Let's look at poverty. And they developed comprehensive mental health and poverty programs to support those students, and they had dramatic increases in sort of the their 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 most their most vulnerable learners. Okay, so there is opportunity uh, after catastrophe. All right. So if we're thinking about us and we're thinking about the COVID nineteen pandemic, okay, a couple things. The realities. I mean, here in Nova Scotia. I think my math is right here. We had schools closed for nine months over two years. Okay. Still, we have these constraints of COVID protocols. We have the masking, we have the social distancing, we have the sanitization. That's 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 at play. Um, there's learning gaps that are present and varied, right? We 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 see that. We had a we we see that there's there's gaps, particularly in our grades primary one and two students, our, our grade our grade two students in, in, in particular. Um, and there's mental health challenges, uh, attendance issues uh, abound, right? It's been very, very difficult. Uh, it's been very difficult for families. It's been very difficult for students. It's been very difficult for educators. I mean, it is it is not uh, it's not a, a necessarily stable time for for people's uh, people's mental health. Uh, and teacher burnout and stress is abundant. And I work with 66 schools. I went into a number of schools, talked to a lot of principals, talked to a lot of teachers this year. And it is. And 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 I'm sure the educators here will say the same thing. It's it's been a very stressful year it's been very very difficult this is not we no, none of us signed up to teach this way all of us want to be doing better with our students we don't want to have to be worrying about social distancing and things like that we don't want to be worrying about pandemics or being sick and and we certainly we're taking on a lot so and i, I totally understand that okay but i am also i'm an optimist and i'm very uh i i i want to i want to i want to make the best of bad situations so a couple opportunities one we've had in our province deep investments in in technology and remote instruction okay we have we have more chromebooks we have more computers and we have more uh more you know great tools that teachers are comfortable using uh for learning with their students we've got a broader awareness of high leverage practices okay there's a lot more conversations now in our in our schools about small the, the benefits of small group instruction and the benefits of relationship building and the benefits of uh culturally responsive pedagogy and the, the you know the power of of of, of anti-bias education okay we're, we we've rolled out our new inclusive ed policy and we're really trying to focus on like, what does that mean like our, how do we take that seriously how do we really believe in in, in inclusive uh educational uh, uh, practices and how do we change what we're doing to really make that 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 uh, a meaningful thing? Uh, and then we have a renewed curriculum. I mean, our, our grade seven and eight curriculum was most recently renewed, but but from primary to grade eight right now, we have we have we have a skills continuum. We have a skills centric. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't want to say skills centric, but we have a skills focused curriculum where. We are elevating um, the 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 looking at skills that are transferable to any situation uh, at the same level as our as our as our content. So thinking about you know you know what can students do outside of school with these non-transferable skills. And the last thing is I think, and this is kind of understated, but but provincially and regionally, teachers and educators have permission to think and act differently. If I read the inclusive ed policy correctly. If I read the new renewed curriculum properly, if I look at what what regional centers for education are saying, they want us to 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 be bold and creative and try new things and 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 get away from 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 stale practices. So we have the permission, right? So we just have to figure out a way to do it that it doesn't you know break our backs. So so that's kind of a little a little piece there. So so that's just to, all to say that little section is. Big stuff can happen after a catastrophe. So 
Um, I guess what I'll what I'll say now is this is the this is kind of the big the meaty section here of the of the presentation. So this is just it's thinking about not more, just different. And I'm going to look at at kind of four four domains um, for for change in a post COVID classroom. So we're going to look at lesson design, inclusivity, assessment, and and, and relationships. And uh, you know I think about you know we we we. All, almost every teacher I meet is 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 working hard, right? Almost every teacher I meet is is a hard worker. But I heard a great story um, the other day. It was about two lumberjacks, right? And these two lumberjacks, they both go to work uh, at the same time every day, and they both go home at the same time every day. But one of the lumberjacks, um, at one point every day for an hour, he just leaves. But then when he comes back, he ends up chopping more wood than the other lumberjack. And after like, you know, a couple of years, the, the lumberjack that, that's, that's chopping less wood, but not taking an hour off every day goes, okay, what's the deal? Like, what, what are you, what are you doing? He's like, you, you leave every day for an hour and come back and you still chop more wood than me. So what's going on? What's your secret? And the lumberjack that goes home for an hour, uh, every day says, Oh, I go, I go home and I, I sharpen my ax. So what I'm saying is, is that, you know, we might be all working hard, but are we working on things that are effective? Are we sharpening our ax in terms of, are we doing things that are high leverage? Are we doing things that are practical? Are we doing things that are moving the needle forward? So what I'm saying from all this is, you know, this is not about doing more stuff. It's about looking at the things that you're doing now and thinking about how they can be done differently. What can we what can we pair out um, to make things more effective in our classroom? So from Jennifer Gonzalez's podcast on the moving away from the easy button, she's got this great quote. And this is the if there's one kind of line that you 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 remember from from this presentation, I would hope it is this. And so she says, let's start to look at every decision that we make about the way we do school with a more critical lens. And every time before we move forward, let's be asking ourselves, is this the best move or are we just hitting the easy button, right? So it's a very simple reflective question that you wanna ask yourself when you're sitting down to plan a unit of study, when you're sitting down to make an activity, when you're sitting down to assess, is, is, is this my best move? Is this my higher leverage move? Or am I just hitting the easy button? Okay, so that's that's kind of where this comes from. So I'm going to talk about kind of four four domains here. So the first one is in in lesson design. Okay, so so let's think about how can we how can we what are some practical things we can do in thinking about lesson design? Well, the first one is 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 less fluff, right? Less busy work. You know, that usually comes with a lot of marking for us. And when you're put, giving out worksheets and we're giving out activities, you get lots of disengagement because things feel very routine. It's stuff that they've always done. It's worksheets that they've constantly been doing. It's 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 fluffy, right? It's, it, you know, you want to create activities that are densely packed with learning, right? So you, you got to think: is this is this just fluff? You want to use backward design, right? What is it that I explicitly want my students to learn? Okay. And what are some really clear, concise, and interactive and engaging ways that I can I can I can present that to my students? Okay, so less fluff and much more concentrated, clear, focused, laser focused. Right. Another thing, more active, hands-on, and 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 inquiry-based. Right. Like we want our we want to integrate play into into our teaching. We want our kids to feel like they're having fun and they're moving. You know. Do you want to build activities that makes your students' hearts beat? Doesn't mean that they're 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 you know disengaged. Uh, doesn't mean that they're not doing actual learning work. What it means is you know you can have students answering questions and doing activities where they're actually moving around. I used to do a great activity. My students loved it. I would just take a couple pieces of Bristol board. I would write some questions on them, like answer questions one and three, or answer questions two and six, and I would chop it up. In, into a puzzle and clip it together. And I would have six of these these puzzles and I'd write six questions on the board. And uh, I'd say, okay, I got six questions. I want you to do all the questions. Um, and then I would say, ah, uh, that's, you know what? That's 
that's too much. I, that's that. I don't want you to do all the questions. Here's what we're gonna play a little game. I want you to get into your groups, and one person from your group, I want you to run up and grab this puzzle, and on the puzzle, it's gonna tell you two questions to answer, but you're not gonna know which two they are. So one person is gonna grab the puzzle, then you're gonna solve the puzzle, then another person's gonna run up and grab a piece of paper from me and run back, then you're gonna answer the question, then your group is gonna edit your answer and make sure that it's detailed, then one other person is gonna run and hand me the sheet, and we're gonna have a little fun race about it. Okay, so they were engaging with the content and they were doing the learning and the activity and the responses that I wanted, but they're moving, they're excited, they think that they're playing a game. Well, they are playing a game and, and they're having fun, right? The other powerful thing that we have is, is, is inquiry-based learning. It's an explicit uh, model built into the seven and eight curriculum, but it works at, at all grade levels. And the idea around inquiry-based learning is that, that your students are working on group activities where they're taking ownership of their learning they have multiple ways to show what they're doing, and they're 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 engaging in a project that they have ownership over. And instead of you being the instructor and the teacher standing up in front of the class and telling them everything that they need to know, you are guiding them. You're walking through with them. You're giving them options. Okay. You're helping them find resources. It's taking all the time out of summative assessment and all the time out of um, planning for lessons, and it flips it so that. All that you're doing is observing and having conversations with your students, and that becomes the the focus of your of your marks. That becomes how you build relationships with them, and that gives them more engagement over the content. So inquiry based learning is a big big thing. Excellent book on inquiry based learning here, Trevor McKenzie's Dive into Inquiry. Great great uh, great great text on this. More collaboration in small group structures. You want to be able to 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 work in small groups as much as possible. If you've got inquiry based learning or centers going on, that's a big thing to set up. The big work in setting up small group structures is is two things. One, you have to know what you're looking for, and you have to know what you're what you're assessing in your conversations and observations when you're working with a small group. You have to be committed to to, to meeting with small groups. Small group instruction is effective at all levels, all grade levels, um, but the big thing is you have to have really good discipline and setup for 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 that. When I when I would set up my guided reading uh, stations or my inquiry based learning units when I was teaching, I would have a big month where I was just training them on how to work, like while I was with a small group. So we would role play and we would talk about how I would call home and I would pretend to get really angry at them in this little role play if they weren't, you know, focused with their group. And we would have activities that they had to sort of monitor themselves. So it's 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 a lot of work, but if you invest, you know, about a month getting it set up for what you want it to look like while you're working in sm with small groups, then you're going to have a, a massive impact. And the last one, fewer live lectures, more flipped learning. We have a really cool project happening in some of our schools next year called um, the, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it. I think it's uh, the Modern Classrooms Project. That's it. And basically, it's, it's, it's a mastery content. You have to demonstrate mastery over a topic. But you get to choose which components of the unit that you engage with. So there might be six little activities you have to do. You get to choose which order you do them in. You have to demonstrate mastery, whether it's through a Google quiz or an interview with a student or a project. Um, but it's all based on flip learning. So you pre-record the lessons, you pre-record the activities, you upload them to a website. Really, really exciting stuff going on. We saw it lightly experimented with last year at one of our high schools here. Uh, and I just put a little button for Loom here. That's I love that as a screen recording tool if you want to pre-record your lessons. Uh, and I have, if you're on here, this this Loom link is it's hyperlinked. So to sign up for the educator version, if you sign up, you get free free access to 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 Loom. So that's that's the that's the um, that's the uh, the lesson design domain. So the next one is on assessment. And in terms of, 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 of assessment, like what can we change? What can we move away from the easy button? What should we be doing differently for assessment? Well, one, we should be doing more feedback and fewer grades. And I think this kind of speaks to a little bit about what Mario was saying in the chat. And again, if you have anything you want to post into the chat, you just throw it in there. I'll keep my eye on it. Um, more feedback and fewer grades. And I mean, we are required by some degree to do to do grading um, with our students and give our students grades. But we know that that you know the grades are quick and, and easy to give, but but timely, specific feedback is much more powerful. And talking to your students uh, about how to respond to feedback is of 
is of the utmost importance. If they know how to respond to feedback, then you're going to have an, a really effective feedback loop and you're going to see, see growth, right? So that's why getting into those environments where you're having more conversations and observations and working with small groups more frequently um, is, 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 so, is so important. Um, and, you know, grading just, uh, marking papers takes so much time. And, you know, my last two years of teaching, I tried to reduce everything. I had no, my students received no, no, no physical grades my last two years of teaching. I had rubrics and I had marks for them and I had stuff on power school and I had stuff on, on, you know, their report cards, obviously, but I never, I never gave them a, a mark. I gave them explicit feedback, whether it was with a pre-recorded audio, whether it was with a conversation or whether it was with a paragraph that I would write, um, on on their writing or i would highlight a section of their text and give them a really big big comment or i would sit with them and just really talk with them about where they were and what they were doing right that I, giving giving them out grades was was I, I, it wasn't useful i i didn't have any real parent pushback because the parents still got the report card and 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 but there was no surprises on, on the report card the students sort of knew knew where they were and 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 it, it worked out very well but, but I also had a much better relationship with my students because we were constantly engaged in conversation about their work. We weren't just like, here's this, and now I'm gonna go behind a wall and I'm gonna give you a mark and then I'm gonna throw it down on your desk and, and you're gonna have to figure out you know, who you are as a human because of that. So anyways, more iteration as well. So multiple opportunities to 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 improve on your work, right? Uh, you know, you shouldn't just stamp stamp kids with one grade give 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 a way to be dynamic right like like again we 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 we've got these old models where we say okay you've got you know you've got a 6 out of 10 on this and and that's it right well we have to have more you know let students you know if they if they struggle with something or if they 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 weren't meeting in something give them another path and work with them as part of that relationship building you know as part of that that formative assessment to to try something different right a lot of things like from the shutdown, more fluid deadlines. We had all kinds of fluid deadlines because of uh, when we were in remote learning. But that that's something that I think can 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 uh, occur, you know, even 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 more, right? Like, why do we have all these crazy deadlines? I know that, you know, sometimes we're stamped in where we have to get a mark in on 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 uh, on gradebook, or we have to get marks in for for report cards. But I mean, you know, we need to think about that that fluidity of of um, of our work. And the last one is more small group tasks, right? We want to be working with our students much more in small group settings. And I've talked a little bit about that. Um, and you know, in terms of assessment, I put three kind of tools down here, little icons. We have excellent tools for gathering formative data now. Okay, so Google Docs. I mean, that's been around for years, but I love it because. When my students are working on a document, I can open it up, I can give them a comment in real time, and then I can instruct them to respond to me um, in, in in real time as well. So we can have that conversation right there. It's not anymore, they hand this in, I comment on it, I give it back, right? And it's all captured. By the end of, uh, a, a, of a piece of writing or a creation of something on a Google document or a Google slideshow, I have a whole list of a conversation that I've had with the students. That's my assessment. That's my formative assessment. Okay. Who cares about the mark? Who cares about the good copy? It's right there. The proof is in the pudding. Here's what I wanted them to do. Here's how I talked to them about it. And here's how they responded. It's all built right in there. Right. We also have Nearpod. I mean, that was, we approved Nearpod in our region this year. I don't know if it's approved in every, every regional center, but it just caught on like wildfire. It's a, it's a synchronous and asynchronous tool. It captures every single student's response and saves it for you. When you're done a session, like you can get their 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 audio, you can get their typing, you can get their choices that they've made, you can get the selections that they pick, and then you can download all their individual work as a PDF, or you can see them as an entire class. It captures it all for you, so it really distills that formative process. And then the other one that I, I mean, I've been in love with Flipgrid for years, but Flipgrid is excellent. It's just it's like you can you can capture your students thinking and learning and you can respond to them you know and you can create a video for them you can make it really fun and it makes them very very creative so those are just some formative tools that you know if, if i was thinking about changing up my assessment strategy i'd be using those i, I i'd use those three all, often um so i kind of just talked about those 
the third domain is is on inclusivity. So when we're thinking about you know you know inclusivity, uh, you know more universal design, right? So you have to have a toolkit, really. You, your 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 kids have to be given permission, and you have to be open. Um, you know, you define what learning is, what what's expected. Here's what I want you to learn. But if you give your kids and your students a number of tools to to show that learning, it opens things up, right? If you teach them how to do uh, uh, create a movie, if you teach them how to do stop motion, if you teach them how to create a flip grid, if you teach them how to make, you know, uh, on Canva an, an, an infographic, right? And then you give them to the permission, you work with them, you say, okay, well, you know, what are you trying to do here? What are you trying to build? What is it you want to show me? Well, you know, and what tool do you want to use, right? And yeah, you might have, you know, 10, 12 different things passed in, right? And they all look different. But if your rubric is based on the learning that you want to see, and not the not the thing that you want to see, right? It's two it's two different things. You want to see the learning. Who cares what the thing is? You you want to see what they can what 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 the what the knowledge is, right? What the understanding is, right? So more UDL. Um, another big thing I've been thinking a lot about is 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 uh, 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 in the last years is is introverts, right? And 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 the thing that we have to come to grips with, I think, in education, and it's so rarely talked about, is is you know. We've got a lot of introverts in, 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 in education. And our teaching often supports extroverts. Our, 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 our system rewards extroverts. You know, the kid that, that, that's, that's not afraid to put their hand up in class, the kid that, 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 that's really, you know, confident in, in speaking, right? And so if we're thinking about introversion, like, so I guess to, to define what, what, what introversion and extroversion is, basically, um, it, you know, uh, a, 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 an extrovert gains energy from social interaction and an introvert loses energy from social interaction okay so uh, a a uh, an, an extrovert wakes up with you know nothing every morning and every time they have a social interaction they gain a point right and an introvert wakes up with you know maybe five points and every time they have a social interaction it's it's they lose a point and they get they get drained right and I, you know, I'm 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 an introvert. I'm I, I get drained by 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 social interaction. And I know that there's students who get drained by that too. So so having, you know, uh, having options for for introverts, supporting our, our our introverted students, right? They'll introverted people will talk to individuals. They'll open up, right? They're often very very sort of expressive. So we have to leverage, you know, them in our classrooms as well. We can't always be doing activities that benefit the eager beavers. We have to support sort of sort of our our, our introverts. So it's all about building relationships with them and thinking about how we can we can we can support them. And the other one here is better representation in classroom materials and activities. Okay, and this is about you know having a classroom experience that speaks to diversity. And when I started teaching, I think you know when I was a literacy teacher, it was like I'm just gonna do these books that I liked when I was a kid, and all my books are about you know like white people going on white people adventures and doing, you know, white people things. It's like, you know, and I, I was so funneled and I had such a, so many, so many diverse, you know, classroom people in my classroom. And it's like, I'm not showing them, I'm not showing them a, a multivaried experience here. I'm not showing them, you know, anything that's, that, that's you know, kind of like this bland Western stuff. So my last couple of years of teaching, I found there's a couple of really good resources. There's this one place that's called diverse book finder. So, it's kind of for younger kids, kids, but it's like you can identify and explore multicultural picture books, and and it's a really great tool to kind of look for new and and, and existing books. And there's also diversebooks.org. I have a link on here for 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 these tools um, as well. But 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 find you know you know we're we we need to be past the point where we're kind of talking about you know diversity and we're actually putting it into action. So our classrooms have to be speaking to that and have to have content like that and have to have materials like that. So we just have to build, we have to build that in. Like, I mean, I mean it's it's time to stop kind of saying like we want to do it and do it, right? And the last one is all is relationships. And these are, this is, a, this is, this is the most important thing. This is the big one, right? If you don't have this, you don't have any, you can't teach or, or you're not being an effective teacher or you're struggling and stressed out all the time. If you have really good relationships with your students, I don't think teaching feels hard at all. So you have to have dedicated time for relationship building built in, right? You have to you have to have that. I used to have an activity. So my small group instruction, it would be like it'd be like 
you know, kind of freeform Friday. So my students are all working on, on, on a center or on a, 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 an inquiry-based project task. And then in my small group instruction on Friday, it's really just about checking in, seeing how they're doing, talking with them, listening to them, talking about what they're up to. And I would include a learning piece and I would get them to write about it. I'd get them to write about what we talked about or set a goal. But it was really about me getting to know them and 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 build in those relationships. I also used to start this the year with this activity called uh, a million words or less, right? So, and I would say, okay, we've you know it's the first day of school and I've got a big homework project, but it's not for me. It's for your parents, and it's called a million words or less. And I want you to take this home, and I want your parents to to write me a letter all about you, everything I need to know, and it has to be a million words or less. And the kids get kind of kick out of that. And then I send this in and the parents will often send me in these letters or send me in emails. And then I would just pour over them and I would take copious notes and I would have a little chart. And I'd like, I needed to know the students as quickly as possible and know all the little things that they might not be comfortable telling me about or all the little things that the parents want me to know about them. And then you can use that information to, to, to leverage your relationships, right? I had a student that that just had struggled for years. No one had connected to him, and he was really into this Japanese comic called Naruto. I didn't know anything about Naruto, but this kid, I kind of wanted to open up to him. So I went on a tear one night and just went down the rabbit hole of researching Naruto and watching YouTube videos of Naruto. And I had never, I had no idea it's this entire world. But when I came in. And I had a bunch of Naruto comics that I had brought into the classroom library and started talking to him about Naruto. It's like he opened right up. And then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, you know what? You you want to show me, you know, what you know about this project? Can you make me a Japanese anime comic, kind of like Naruto about this? And he's all in, right? So getting to know them, right? More parent communication and collaboration. We saw parent communication increase dramatically during the shutdown. I don't think that needs to stop. I think that it's very important to have regular communication with parents, particularly with the students that you feel uh, you need, uh, you know, some relationship building with, or you need to get to know more, or you need to support more. You need to build a relationship with the parents and and, and do that collaboratively. I ask a lot of teachers like, or, or have retired, like what's the biggest change you saw over, over um, your time teaching? And one teacher said to me once, well, when I started teaching, you know, in the in the in the seventies, parents and, and and teachers were were like this, and slowly it seems that parents and teachers are getting farther apart. And I guess what I'm saying is, I I, I want us to think about ways to get parents and teachers back as close together um, as possible. So having good communication, reaching out, contacting them early and often, having a system set up where you can get in touch with them. More relational practices. I mean, relational practices are so important. Talking to students about, you know, instead of when there's an issue, you know, being punitive, right? We have to say, you know, we have to say, okay, you know, sit down. Let's identify what, 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 what was the harm here. Let's consider who was affected, okay? And let's let's carry out a plan to repair this, right? It's much better than than being punitive. Nobody nobody benefits from 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 you know being punished. Everybody benefits from learning how to repair a situation, right? That's the kind of society that we want to live in. So it has to be the kind of school that we're providing, where we're saying, okay, here's the harm. Here's who was affected. What what? How do we how do we repair this? And I have never met a student that when you're talking to them like this one on one, they don't they can't open up to that, right? Yeah, they might be in the class and they might be showing off and they might be horsing around. But one on one, if you can get deep and earnest with that conversation, you can have really, really powerful kind of change in, in, in your students. And then the last one is, you know, we need to have more anti bias work in, 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 in what we're doing. We have to be engaged with it. And again, it's the same thing I said about um, diverse or, you know, diverse content in classrooms. It's, it's time to stop, you know, saying we want to do it or talking about getting started or right? it's time to do like it's time to we have to like put our boots on the ground and actually you know do this we have to nurture diversity in our classroom we have to promote you know what does positive interaction with diversity look like we have to show our students how to be activists about this 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 stuff we have to show them how to identify bias like 
these are things that we have to build into to to our practice and that's that's a part of relationships uh, in, in in our work right glenn singleton here i put a book here he's got an excellent text about courageous conversations about race very very good if you're wondering about um school discipline you know i've got that hacking school discipline by maynard and weinstein so great great texts in there and there's a great cult of pedagogy podcast on relationship building i've also i've also linked in this is just a little chart so this is kind of an example of you know when you get if you if you decide to do those million words or less or relationship building or whatever you have a chart of your students names and you 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 have the category up here of okay here's Here's everything I want to know about them. Here's their passions. Here's what they love. Okay. Uh, here's here's what we know about their family. Here's the activities that they're in. Here's the academics that they are they are into, or the things that they're into or not into. Right. So this Toby person here hates cursing. Here's the food that they like. Here's some physical stuff about them. Here's the skills that they have. Here's some other stuff that we might want to know. Right. And you need to be, you know, you need to treat each student like it's it's like when. You know, my grandfather was just in the hospital and he had uh, a stroke and he, the nurses had this crazy information on him. They had a chart, right? And they were, tr they knew everything about his diet. They knew everything about what he was like as a patient. They knew everything about his medical history. You have to kind of do that, I think, with students. You have to, you have to kind of have a chart of who they are as a person, who they are as a human. And it might evolve throughout the year. They might take on something you need to add that and 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 help nurture that and 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 support that right so you know but it's you have to know your students and you have to constantly be trying to relate with them and constantly trying to communicate with them in order to have those those relationships because again everything falls in place if you if you've if you're if your students are are, are enjoying things right and um you know what i missed on this last side i, I did also mention a deep focus on fun I did want to just mention that that's so important is, is, is it needs to be fun. I've got two boys who um, were, were in two different classes this year and I, I'm always asking them about school and I'm like, okay. So I said to my, my, my youngest son, I said, how do you like school this year? I like it. How do you like your teacher? Oh, I, I like her. Right. And then my older son, Cohen, he says, I said, how do you like school this year? I love school. How do you, how do you like, your teacher this year i love my teacher right now like liking and loving when i'm talking about education are huge huge differences to me right if you say you like something in education that's that's okay but if someone says that they love something that's tells me that that like my son who says he loves school this year and he loves his teacher he has an emotional uh, attachment to his to 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 what's going on in the classroom there he's 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 feeling it right so i talked to his teacher and i was like hey i just want to say like my, my son says he loves you and he loves your class so i'm really interested what what are you doing that makes him emotionally like so emotionally invested in in your classroom and she said well you know every morning cohen really likes chess so you know i let him you know play chess with his friend and then i go over and i talk to him about what they're doing and then when cohen's working cohen likes to draw and so whenever we have an activity in math i let him draw something to show want to show me you know his learning not just fill it up right so she was doing things that were were were, were relational okay so so having fun putting games putting activities putting things thinking about that as an essential ingredient right if you know, if the most commonly used ingredient in, in, in all of cooking is salt, I would say that the most common ingredient that should be used in all of lesson planning and unit planning, it should be fun. Like school should be should be should be fun. I have no idea why it's it's not always fun. OK, so I got about six minutes. This is the last section. It's going to be pretty quick. Um, and then maybe we'll have time for some discussion. I'm happy to hang around. I call this atomic commitments. There's a really great book. Um, by James Clear. You've probably seen it. It's a huge bestseller right now called Atomic Habits. It's a great, great read if you're if, if you're looking for a you know uh, an August summer read. But uh, this session is going to be looking at ways to leverage things without burning ourselves out. So the, the idea here is that you know James Clear says if you can get one percent better each day for one year, you'll end up thirty-seven times better when you're done. 
And he opens the book talking about like a cycling team and how they they looked at they were they were struggling and failing and then they just did all these tiny tiny little tweaks that barely took any time but they did all kinds of them and they ended up becoming like the the best cycling team um in the world and it was just tiny little changes like the fabric on their seats or you know the type of rubber that they bought for their brakes so what i'm saying here is that if you don't want to get burned out, if you want to do do this meaningfully and you want to take on you know making changes post pandemic in a, in, a, in a good way don't take on 500 things at once take on small things take on very clear and concise things and work on those right so if we're thinking about our our habits as educators right habits you know if we're taking on little good habits right their habits are the compound interest of self improvement so so you know you the the little habits that you do you're not going to notice anything right so i in in january i started doing i had a really bad back last year and i started doing yoga in january and i said okay well, i'm going to do like 10 minutes of yoga a day and and after a month right i didn't really see any difference i was no more flexible i felt no more fit i felt like you know i couldn't still couldn't touch my toes right but you know, I was sleeping better. I was waking up better, more refreshed in the morning kind of after I did. And I started noticing little things. And now, so I guess I've been doing it since like January 2nd. And I've been doing yoga every day. And now I'm starting to notice there's some compound interest, right? I can I can finally touch my toes for the the, the first time uh, in, in in my life, and I I'm I'm feeling more flexible, and I can't actually really feel woken up in the morning unless I do some yoga. And really, it just started with 10 minutes, and then I made little tweaks. Let's go to 11 minutes today. Let's go to 12 minutes today. Okay. Let's try on Sundays to do a, a one hour yoga session, right? So just trying little, little things at a time, building up the, the habits, nothing major, nothing giant, nothing that's going to burn me out and make me, you know, crash, right? Tiny little things, right? Um, and the other thing that he talks about a lot in the atomic habits is about your systems. Like you don't, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit about systems okay so don't my my thing is that you shouldn't really think worry about your goals right you should worry about your system your process okay so you want to think about you know what's here's what i would say here would be my challenge to you for this session right think about what's what's a core practice that you want to develop this year in those four areas and i'm going to put a chart up of it right through professional growth or collaborative teaming or through PD, right? You're gonna have, there's a new professional growth appraisal system coming out for all teachers this year, right? There's collaborative teaming in many schools, there's PD, there's all that stuff. What's something that you, what is a goal that you have? What do you wanna be better at by the end of this year, right? That you're not feeling so great about. And what's the system? Like, what's your system, okay? What's a small, immediate, practical change you can do to your system, right? And I say this, I say emphasize your system and your process, not your goals or achievements, right? Goals are fleeting. Once you achieve a goal, that feeling is very fleeting. But if you have a constant system at play that you're constantly working on, if you're constantly trying to improve it, I, I heard an interview of Rob by Robin Williams, and he was saying that you know his, his you know he won an Oscar and um, later into his career, and he's like, well, the feeling of that achievement, that 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 getting that goal, that felt good for like 48 hours, right? And then I just went. You know, I didn't feel good anymore, right? So when we get when we achieve something, we don't feel good for 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 a giant amount of time, right? But what does make us feel good is if we're constantly focusing on improving our our, our system. So what I want you to think about is, you know, look at these four domains. These are the four things that we were talking about, right? Lesson design, assessment, inclusivity, relationships, right? Pick maybe one thing from each category or 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 a couple things but i would say focus on just something really specific right and try to build it in as a habit really small so maybe you want to say more feedback for your grades that's a focus for you right so you say okay i'm going to start my year by trying to constantly give more feedback and fewer grades i'm going to constantly i'm going to build some observational and conversational rubrics that i can use when working with my students right and the idea is like you want to start building that habit in, monitoring yourself, reflecting on it, and then saying, okay, I've got this habit now. Let's move on to something else. 
but don't take on 50 things at once because you're just going to get overblown and you know that your principal and your regions, they're going to be throwing stuff at you as well. So pick a couple things that you can really hone in on and, and really focus on that and try, 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 to, try to build that in, okay? Um, and again, I'm kind of wrapping up here. This is the end of the, 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 the commitment I kind of said in this session was that we were going to, we were going to have resources, but I was trying to think of what a good way to do this is be like, do I make a Google classroom that kind of becomes stagnant? Do I do, uh, uh, like YouTube videos? So I decided actually, I said, well, maybe let's, I've never, let's try a newsletter. I know newsletters are, they're, they're kind of old school but they're having a little bit of a comeback right now. So a couple of colleagues and myself, we're making a newsletter next year called the No More Easy Button Newsletter. And it's really just gonna be some very practical, um, very practical things that you can try to move away from, from the easy button. So if you're interested, I've put a QR code in here and I've put a link in here. If you wanna sign up for the newsletter, we're probably gonna send it out, you know, every couple of weeks or maybe monthly i we haven't really decided on it yet but the idea is that it's just something that you know every now and then you get that gives you some practical tools in these four domains to think about and support you right so it's an idea of just something kind of ongoing i don't know we, i don't know if it's going to take off i don't know if it's going to work but you know something that 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 might be of benefit or, or of a resource to you so that's it. I mean, my time, I think, is, is up, and you might be going to a new session soon. Um, but I, I, I thank you so much for 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 joining me today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions or anything you want to discuss, please flow it uh, or flow it, throw it into into the chat. I'll be happy to answer it. If not, uh, I, ha I hope you have a great uh, remainder of of your summer, um, and uh, I wish you the best of luck in in your in your upcoming upcoming school year. And at any time, feel free to reach out. Uh, to me, Hintonay at CCRCE. Thanks. Thank you very much.